So I'd like to welcome everybody to the webinar today. Today's webinar is, in, is on anti-GBM vasculitis. And I just wanna say how appropriate it is for the day that we are doing this webinar live and our recording it is uh, rare disease day. And I think we will find out today, this is one very rare disease. And I'd like to start out by saying I'm Kathy Olewski and I'm the webinar host for the Vasculitis Foundation's 2023 educational webinar series. I love doing these informative webinars as I am also a vasculitis patient living with MPA vasculitis. And we have a great guest today. Our guest is Dr. Elizabeth Brandt. She's an assistant professor of medicine at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. She earned her medical degree at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, and she completed her residence in internal medicine at Tulane University Hospital and Clinic in New Orleans. And she was a Vasculitis Foundation Fellow. Dr. Brandt also completed a nephrology fellowship at the University of North Carolina Medical Center in Chapel Hill, which is where I met her. <laughs> and her specialty is nephrology. And um, I was gonna say, just out of curiosity, before we actually get going, can I have a show of hands if you or a family member have a diagnosis of anti-GBM or good pastures? I can't see everybody, but I can see a few. I see at least one. Let's see if I can scroll over and see if there are any others. Nope, I only saw one hand up, so. But that's good to know. It's a very rare disease, and we wanted to know a little bit about who we were talking to. <laughs> um, and before I ask Dr. Brandt to do her presentation about anti-GBM, I just want to cover a few housekeeping notes for our webinar today. So actually, Dr. Brandt, if you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen while I go over the housekeeping notes, that would be great. Okay. Um, this is... This is a live webinar, so we ask you to keep yourself muted to reduce the background noise. We're also recording this webinar so others can view it at a later date. So after Dr. Brandt shares her uh, presentation with us about anti-GBM, we will have a question and answer section and we'll have some questions that have already been submitted in advance, but we'd be happy to take your questions today too. And to ask questions, look for the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And if you don't see it right now, click the three dots to the far right at the bottom of your screen that say more. And also if, and, and then you should see it in there. And also if you see a question in the Q&A section that's already suggested and you'd like to know the answer to that one also, hit the thumbs up and that'll move it up higher on our list so we know more people are interested. And about the questions, we would like you to remember that Dr. Brandt cannot give you specific medical advice about your personal medical situation because you're not her patient, but she will do her best to answer questions thoroughly without advising you personally. And one last thing, if you have a Zoom technical question, something's not working for you, you can drop that question in the chat and our faithful helper, Emily, will do her best to answer you and try and work out the situation for you. And now that all that housekeeping is done, um, Dr. Brandt, if you're ready, we would love to learn more about anti-GBM good pastures. All righty. So um, it, this is gonna be a pretty quick overview. Um, well, you'll see why. Um, so the two pictures on the front, I think um, are good uh, uh, reflections of what we see with anti-GBM disease, which are lung involvement and kidney involvement. And in case you don't know what that picture on the right is, it's what's called a glomerulus. Um, it's one of the little tiny filters in the kidneys. And when we do a kidney biopsy and it's stained with a particular chemical, this is exactly what we see is this very ribbony, bright greenish yellow uh, pattern like that is very, very classic and specific for anti-GBM. Um, and on the left, is a patient who has pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, so those lungs, I think those are pretty obviously lungs, um, those should be pretty black on a chest X-ray. So air is black on a chest X-ray. So the fact that that is so hazy and white is not really a good thing. Hmm. All righty. So uh, the uh, sort of our key points today, <clears throat> and I'll go into a little more detail on each. This is a really, truly rare disease. 
you know, people talk about you know, lots of many to most forms of vasculitis are rare, but this is truly rare among the rare. And it's got what's called a bimodal distribution, which means it largely occurs in two different patient populations that I'll talk a little more about. It's caused by autoantibodies or an autoantibody, meaning your own immune system has made antibodies to you, specifically to the basement membrane and the lungs and in the kidneys. And the basement membrane is simply part of the lining, uh, the walls of the little tiny blood vessels, the little capillaries. Um, and so we find that basement membrane, it's a particular molecule there, um, and that molecule, that basement membrane occurs in lung and kidneys. It's really, truly important that people get a prompt diagnosis for effective treatment, but that's sometimes difficult, um, and we'll talk about why that might be. There is treatment available, which is the good news. Um, so there you go. <clears throat> so when I said rare, the the ends what we call the incidence, meaning how uh, how many people are affected in a period of time, is about one in one million people per year. So people make that joke about, oh, it's one in a million. It is truly one in a million. Um, the, the sort of the most I could find was like 1.64 people per million per year. Um, it actually usually occurs in Caucasians, sometimes Asians, rarely in African-American or Black patients, um, although I have seen it. So there you go, just to prove that it's usually and not always. So what I meant by bimodal, here are two groups. It tends to either be in patients who are between the ages of 15 and 35, and that's usually men, or older than late 50s, so 60s and above. In that group, it's usually women. However, nothing is absolute. So you can see this in other age groups, including children. Um, as we mentioned at the very beginning, it can affect the lungs, the kidneys, or both. It is usually a one and done situation. So typically you get anti-GBM, it does what it's gonna do, you're not gonna have it again. It's not gonna relapse. In very rare instances, it can. And there are specific risk factors for that. But in general, it doesn't occur twice, which is one of the nicer things I could say about it. Um, as I mentioned, it's caused by these auto antibodies, auto meaning self, to the basement membranes and the lungs and the kidneys. Now, when can it recur? If somebody um, has a transplant, a kidney transplant, it can potentially recur in the transplant if the anti-GBM antibody is still present. Um, anti-GBM, the GBM is that glomerular kidney basement membrane, also in the lungs. I don't know why we don't include the lungs in the name. Um, so if you don't get rid of that antibody entirely, before transplant, it can recur or if the antibody comes back. But again, that's pretty unusual. So um, if there's any injury to the lungs uh, that can expose that, that molecule in the basement membrane, because it's usually sandwiched between other layers, that, will, that exposure will allow the immune system to see that molecule again. And that's where you might get a recurrence in the lungs. But that relapse, again, is rare. So as far as the specific risk factors, inhalation injuries. So if you inhale certain chemicals like organic solvents that can expose the basement membrane, one of the biggest, biggest risk factors for recurrence in the lungs is smoking. Now, I should not have to tell anyone that smoking is bad for you, right? I should not have to tell you that. So, I'm, But I'm telling you that it's very bad for you. And if you have anti-GBM, it is really bad for you. Um, so whatever it takes. Most things in life, I say, you know, at least moderation, this is not one of those things. You just need to stop doing it. Stop it. Stop it, people. All right. Um, prompt diagnosis. Ooh, this part is challenging. So what, what are some of the signs and symptoms? And what the heck is the difference between a sign and a symptom? Well, a sign is what a sign is. It's a thing that you see. So somebody might look at you and say, you know, if you have uh, if you have chicken pox and go, you have a rash, that's a sign. And you might say, my rash is very itchy. Well, the itching is a symptom. So just to give you a little bit of the difference there. So in lungs, you might have a cough and it might involve coughing up some blood, a little or a lot. 
hopefully if there's a lot, you would just head your little selves right to the emergency room, right? That is not a, hmm, let me wait and see if it goes away. Under no circumstances is that a good idea. Um, people can get very short of breath and it can be really, really severe. They can even have respiratory failure to the point that when they do um, get to medical care, they might even need to be intubated and put on a ventilator for a period of time. It can cause chest pain um, in the kidneys. Patients might have blood in their urine. Now, you may not see that blood. So this would be something that, you know, you go for your checkup and hmm, they happen to do a urinalysis and there's blood there and there's not a good explanation for it. That is a potential uh, sign. That's a sign, not a symptom. You don't feel blood in your urine. Foamy urine, foamy, foamy, like soap suds, uh, head of a beer kind of foam. Um, the, the downside is, if you have symptoms of kidney failure, those don't occur until kidney failure is really, really advanced. And so if you're having symptoms of kidney failure, the horse is out of the barn and running down the highway. Um, so it's not great. Um, one thing to bear in mind, right? These symptoms are so kind of universal, vague, nonspecific. Most of the time, they're not gonna be due to anti-GBM right? I just told you it's really, really rare. However, any of these things that occur are usually something pretty serious, right? If you are coughing up blood, that's pretty darn serious. That could be a lot of things. That could be that you have a clot in your lung. Well, that's potentially life-threatening. It could be that you have a cancer in your lung. That could be life-threatening. So shortness of breath, if it is really severe shortness of breath, right? That's bad. So if you have blood in your urine, you have foamy urine, any of these things, you still need to seek medical attention and find out what it is. It's just not likely to be anti-GBM. Oops. All right, so the good news is that there is treatment available. So that usually includes what are called corticosteroids or steroids for short. Prednisone is one, methylprednisolone is one usually uh, initially given IV, and that would be methylprednisolone, so through a vein, and then prednisone is the oral form of that. And so people are usually on a course of that uh, for some months. Um, the sort of main treatment is an immunosuppressant called cyclophosphamide or cytoxan. That's actually a chemotherapy agent that was first used um, to treat cancer, but then was found to be very effective. It's actually used in a lot of autoimmune diseases and it's very, very effective. Um, there's another immunosuppressant called rituximab that's also used for a lot of autoimmune conditions. Um, and that might be used, it's still not the preferred treatment. Um, we just don't know enough about how well it's gonna work. It, logically, it should work, um, but not clear that it, it will quite do the same thing that the cyclophosphamide will. Um, one of the other big parts of treatment, especially when there's what we call pulmonary hemorrhage, so here, if you have blood in your lungs, that is called pulmonary hemorrhage, is plasmapheresis. And that's where your blood is um, cycled through a machine and it's removing this antibody, this autoantibody that is causing the whole problem. Um, so that's the purpose. And, and plasmapheresis is usually done roughly every other day for a certain number of treatments and there are protocols for that. Um, you do wanna treat until the antibody is completely gone, even if all your signs and symptoms have already resolved. You still want that antibody to be gone. As long as it's there, it can potentially cause problems. How long you're treated and whether or not you're likely to have a re relapse is gonna partly be affected by whether you have anti-GBM overlapping with another disease. And we're gonna get into that uh, a little bit more later, but um, anti-GBM can pretty often occur um, with another form of vasculitis or with another autoimmune kidney disease. So that might determine uh, partly sort of, uh, not so much how you're treated, but for how long you're treated. Uh, when patients have kidney involvement, they might require dialysis either short or long-term. Um, they might ultimately uh, need a kidney transplant, and that can be done. Um, I will say that if, if a person requires dialysis within the first 72 hours of presenting and you know, potentially being diagnosed, 
there's a really high chance that they will require dialysis long-term. Um, I'm not gonna say that's 100%, nothing is 100%, but that's a, a pretty big risk factor for needing long-term dialysis. There are some other, so I was gonna say there's some other resources. There is one really good resource. It is very hard to find patient-friendly information about this disease. I think the best one, and I could be a little biased here, but I don't think so, is actually the UNC Kidney Center website. So here are the steps you go through to get to that. It's unckidneycenter.org. And when you pull up that page, you'll see a, a tab on the page somewhere that says Kidney Health Library, and you wanna click on that. And then on the left-hand side, there'll be this long, 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 long list of things. And you scroll down there, it's in alphabetical order till you get to glomerular disease. Remember, that's the little filter. Click on glomerular disease, and there will be a little subsection under that, and you'll see anti-GBM disease. And there's a nice, nice whole page with some pictures and some explanations in there that is uh, very easy to read and uh, really informative, I think. I looked for some other resources. One of the ones I was thinking, uh, 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 one of the databases I thought might have some information actually doesn't even have any patient information. So that was a little disappointing. Um, but I think that you'll you'll get enough from the Kidney Center website to be knowledgeable and also to sort of think of questions that you might want to ask your provider. So I think that will be helpful. So that is the quick and dirty version of anti-GBM disease. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Brandt. We appreciate that. And you can stop sharing your screen if you would like. And Yay. yeah, because the next step is we're gonna go to where we can have some questions. Um, as I said, right at the beginning, we do have questions that were submitted early um, in advance of the webinar. And we have, we're have we happy to take some questions from some of you today. You can go to the bottom of your screen where you see Q&A and you can um, submit your questions through there so that I can see them so that I can ask Dr. Brandt. And um, if you don't see Q&A at the bottom, just look for the three dots where it says more and you'll see it in there. So I'm gonna start with the first question if that's okay. And the um, one of the first questions we got, which I also would love to know the answer to, is I'm curious about the name change of the disease. Do you know why it was originally called good pastures and why is anti-GBM more accurate or a better fit for this vasculitis? Yes, yeah, so um, um, you'll find that a lot of diseases and not just forms of vasculitis, but a lot, a lot of diseases are named after a person. Um, and that's usually because it's the person who first described it or noticed it or characterized it. And that, that's the case here. So um, his name was Ernest Goodpasture. And in 1919, he had a patient, and I think it was a young man, who had actually influenza, but he developed pulmonary hemorrhage and renal failure due to a glomerulonephritis, so inflammation in the filters of the kidneys. And... Um, and so he sort of described that in a case report. And so going forward, when patients had this combination of pulmonary hemorrhage and this what we call glomerulonephritis, particularly something that happened very rapidly, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, it got called good pasture. Now, over the years, that has just morphed in all kinds of ways. Um, people always use good pasture syndrome uh, versus good pasture disease for different situations. Um, what's interesting is that we now say anti-GBM disease because we actually know what the, what the pathophysiology is. We know what's happening, which is that you've got these antibodies, an, anti, antibodies to the glomerular basement membrane or the basement membrane. And so it is anti-GBM, glomerular basement membrane disease. There are some people who will distinguish good pasture syndrome from anti-GBM disease, whether there's kidney involvement, lung involvement, or both. But in general, the current nomenclature is anti-GBM disease because all that other stuff is just way too confusing. But we, we don't even know if that person, first patient even had anti-GBM disease. He just happened to have pulmonary hemorrhage and glomerulonephritis. Who knows what he had? He could have had encovasculitis. We don't know what he had. <laughs> and his name was Good Pasture. <laughs> and his name was Ernest Good Pasture. So that's where that came from. 
Okay, well, that answers two of the questions that I had. Um, one, I, it, then another small piece of that was uh, someone asked, is anti-GBM its own form of vasculitis or disease, which I think you answered, but let me just ask you for sure. Yeah, so it is its own thing. Um, and again, now that that um, name, anti-GBM disease, is currently used to classify anybody who has lung disease, kidney disease, or both that we know is caused by these specific antibodies. And we know that in part because you can usually measure them in the blood, not always, that there are cases that are um, negative from the blood test, but then you find the antibodies in the tissue. That picture on the first page of the light, you know, the bright lighting up of the kidney, that is clearly glomerular basement membrane disease because that's the only thing that looks like that. So, uh, so anti-GBM can be used for lung, kidneys, both, but you have to have that antibody in blood, in tissue, or in both. Okay. Well, another question from a patient in advance was, is there usually more involvement with either the lung or the kidneys, or, or typically are both organs affected at the same time? This was such a good for everybody. Yeah. So this was this was a really good question, and I did not know the answer to it. I had to look it up. And as it turns out, almost all patients have kidney involvement. It's over 90%. And kidneys and lungs together, you know, every every study is going to give you a different number. So the range is somewhere between 25 and 60% will have both lung and kidney involvement. It's rare. I couldn't even find a number. It's rare for patients to just have lung involvement. Um and I would say the, the folks who tend to have just lung involvement are those patients who already have some lung injury. And we kind of talked about those risk factors for relapse. Well, some of those same things are risk factors for having disease in the first place um, is you've got some sort of something that's caused that molecule to be exposed in the lungs that allows that, that antibody to develop. And there's probably some genetic stuff involved there too, but lung by itself is rare. Lung and kidney is not as common as just lung, as kidneys, which is very, you know, of the rare disease, it's the most common okay. presentation. Interesting. Can the damage caused by the anti-GBM be reversed in the kidneys with treatment, or is the goal just to stop further irreversible damage? And same question for the lungs, can it be reversible? Yeah, no, it's, so it's very interesting. And I think it's because the, the lung involvement is less common it's very hard to find specific information about the lungs. I, I didn't even realize it was going to be that hard. Um, the kidney stuff is, is pretty well known. So the, the answer to can you reverse it or you just stop it, the answer is actually both. So if you present and you have a kidney biopsy, which is sort of the gold standard for diagnosis, and anybody who has suspected kidney involvement should have a biopsy, unless there's a really, really good reason not to. Um, and you don't wait to treat them. If you have a strong suspicion, this is what's going on. You start the treatment till you get the biopsy, but you still want to do the biopsy. Um, so if there's a lot of scarring, scarring does not get better. A scar is a scar. You get a scar on your skin, it may get a little lighter, but it never completely goes away for the most part. So it's the same any tissue in the body and the same is true with the kidneys. If there's, um, I always tell patients that if I do a biopsy and you have very active disease, and a lot of inflammation, I actually like that because I can treat that. I cannot treat a scar. There's nothing I can do about a scar. But anything that's active, we can give you medication, the steroids, the immunosuppression, all that. The idea is to stop that process. Now, if you can stop that process, the parts that are inflamed and icky and gooey and messy will actually recover. And they'll just, you know, be like bright and shiny new. Um, and there's a good chance that you won't go back to the kidney function you had before if you've had some scarring, that part's lost. However, the kidneys have an amazing capacity for the good parts to take over the work of the bad parts. So you can actually see over time some improvement in kidney function simply because those other parts work harder and harder. There's some downsides to that in the long term because those parts are working harder. They get a little tired. Um, but in general, you're both trying to stop that process and reverse anything that hasn't developed into scar. As far as the lungs, um, I can't 
I, I haven't had a million cases, although I was telling Kathy before we started, it's first on me, I had more patients than I sort of realized at first, um, that I've never had a patient with anti-GBM who didn't recover from a lung standpoint. So I, I think, and this is just based sort of on my experience and, and I, I think what I think is logical thought process, the lung presentation is very obvious. People don't get a little short of breath and be short of breath for two or three months. It's usually they are fine and then they are very not fine. All of a sudden they go quickly to get um, care. I, I knew one young woman, this was actually at UNC, Kathy, who a uh, young woman, she was African-American. So just to prove it's not a hundred percent. I think she was driving to work and she suddenly, suddenly just started coughing up copious amounts of blood. She goes, forget work. She goes straight to the emergency room, bless her little heart. And um, the lung part got better, but then she turned out she had kidney failure. That part did not get better. So um, yeah, so the lung part, I think that that gets treated quickly because it's so obvious. The problem with the kidneys, and I think I sort of mentioned this in the talk is that a lot of times kidney uh, symptoms don't develop until there's really advanced kidney failure. And so you may or may not be able to get that back. Um, I usually describe anti-GBM as being kind of like a wildfire. It just sort of sweeps through really fast. Um, can I tell you that it's in an hour a day, a week? No, um, but I would say it's not a disease that smolders along for a period of time. It's pretty darn fast. So what happens a lot of times if there's only kidney involvement, by the time they come to attention, by the time they're not feeling well, it's bad. It's just, it's very, very bad. Um, so uh, I have had patients who, uh, of, of the not thousands of patients I have seen, um, I had one who uh, had sort of an overlap, and we'll talk about that, um, and treated him. He did require dialysis for a while. He came off dialysis for a good amount of time. I want to say maybe even three years. I could be making that number up, but I think it was three years. And then he, before he had to go back on dialysis again, he ended up getting a transplant. So that worked out well for him. Um, and I had a patient who, uh, I was telling Kathy, this was the most remarkable thing I've ever seen, just to, just to show that prompt diagnosis doesn't necessarily help so much with the kidney part of it. She literally developed anti-GBM sitting right in the hospital and I got called about her. I have a lot of stories, by the way, about everything. Um, this is how I teach the fellows. I've got a story for everything. And she came in because she had fallen and she fractured her neck. Because she's not here for anything else. She feels perfectly fine otherwise. And I get a call from the team saying, we need you to see this patient. She has, we think she has glomerulonephritis. I'm like, why do you think that? Well, because she has blood in her urine and it's new. Well, how do you know it's new? Because I'm being a little snarky and I'm like, how do you know it's new? It's a weekend. I'm tired. Leave me alone. And uh, they said, well, because she didn't have it when she got here. I was like, fine. And so this lady, yes, she's got blood in her urine. Yes, she undergoes a biopsy. Yes, she has anti-GBM disease and um, started treatment right away. And she did uh, okay-ish for a little period of time, but within a matter of months, Despite treatment, her kidney function got worse and worse, but then she started having a lot of other problems, just a lot of other problems unrelated to that. So that did not go well in the end. And she ultimately um, would have needed dialysis. She chose not to do that. So she passed away. Um, but that was like literally getting treatment immediately, immediately. And, um, and it still did not go very well. So that one was, that one was a little frustrating. Um, well, I was so this next question might make a, it a moot question based on what you just said, but one of the patients asked, are there any strategies or research into diagnosing anti-GBM sooner before the damage gets worse? Yeah, yeah. And so again, it's, it's very hard. You know, I actually looked because I thought it was such a good question um, because of this problem of delayed diagnosis. And um, I couldn't find anything as far as studies. Um, I think one of the things that is happening is kind of trying to understand the disease process a bit better so that maybe there's a little bit uh, better ability to predict and also who's going to do well and who isn't going to do well. And we we sort of know um, a bit about that 
already, but not a ton. It's very hard to study a disease that is that rare because you don't have enough patients to get any sense of trends or, um, you know, what's more likely to happen in a group versus another group because there is no group. There's just, you know, the handful of patients. Um, so the big thing is going to be like those signs that and symptoms that I mentioned earlier, um, with the hard part being the kidney part that a, a lot of times it's just not going to show up. And this is going to sound completely dorky, um, but in, especially in the sort of during and post-COVID era is do go to the doctor every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, I literally, I see patients who um, walk into my clinic, not due to anti-GBM disease, but just in general. And the day they walk in my door, I have to tell them, you know, you're ultimately going to need dialysis because by the time they've walked in my door, they have very advanced kidney failure. Why do they have advanced kidney failure? Because they haven't been to the doctor in 25 years. And they had, a, I have one guy, he just had really bad headaches and he finally goes to the doctor. Well, you have bad headaches because you have kidney failure. So um, so go to the doctor once a year or so. Have them check you out. Have them do a little urine test. Um, maybe a little blood work. Just a little bit of blood work. Just, you know, not done. A little bit. Such great advice. Um, I, you know, this next question, is anti-GBM treated similar to other forms of vasculitis or does it require any specialized medications or therapy that are not usually used with more common forms of vasculitis? It's interesting because in your presentation, you named the things that I was treated with for my right. 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 limited form of vasculitis, but I'll let yeah. you answer that question. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there, so there's a, there's, there's overlap with disease and there's overlap with treatment. So you'll see some uh, real commonalities among autoimmune diseases in general, but especially autoimmune kidney disease, even if it involves other organs. So things that you'll hear about are plasmapheresis. That's that whole circulating and removing the antibody. The drug called cyclophosphamide, the drug called rituximab, and the steroids. Those are like four of the mainstays of treatment of just about everything. Yeah. Um, what's a little bit different is that, so for, um, for anti-GBM, plasmapheresis, especially with pulmonary hemorrhage, always, always gets plasmapheresis. Um, again, you want to remove that antibody quickly, quickly. Cyclophosphamide is still the preferred treatment for anti-GBM disease. It does work. Again, you still may end up with kidney failure, but you'll be alive. So, the, you know, no joke there. But um, what's a little bit different is that one of the diseases that overlaps both literally and figuratively with anti-GBM is something called ANCA-associated vasculitis. So they will often occur together um, or individually. It used to be that the treatment for ANCA-associated vasculitis was also steroids, plasmapheresis, and cyclophosphamide. Mm -hmm. We don't do plasmapheresis much anymore unless somebody has pulmonary hemorrhage. We don't do it for just kidney involvement. And we're using less and less steroids. All of that was based on some very large studies. And instead of using cyclophosphamide as our first choice agent, we now use rituximab as our first choice. So cyclophosphamide, first choice for anti-GBM, rituximab for ankyvasculitis. And anti-GBM can overlap with something called membranous, not a form of vasculitis. It is a form of autoimmune kidney disease. And the um, now, it used to be that the main treatment was cyclophosphamide. We don't do that much anymore, and we use rituximab. So, But it's still sort of these same things that you'll hear uh, sort of cited over and over again, those, those four treatments. Similar. So a, a real good question, and I heard you briefly touch on it, but why is relapse uncommon with anti-GBM? What makes you less likely to have a relapse than a patient who has MPA, GPA, EGPA? Yeah. So the answer is, I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but I, I really, I don't know the answer and I could not find an answer. I tried to look to see if I could find anything with an explanation and uh, I could not find anything specific. So I thought, well, well, I'll make up an answer. So I'm going to make up an answer. So, because that's just what I do. Um, and just know that it's made up. Okay. Just, uh, I'm, that's my caveat there. My disclaimer this is a made up answer. I think it has to do with how the diseases occur. So, with anti GBM, I've told you it's an antibody to this molecule that's in a membrane that is normally hidden. 
-hmm. from the circulation from the immune system. So when it's going to relapse is when that membrane gets exposed. So that's not going to happen under ordinary circumstances. In the lungs, it's going to happen because of another injury, but you all have all stopped smoking or you never smoked. Good for you. Um, and so you're not going to have that kind of injury. It can rarely occur if somebody has a lung infection. That's not very common. Um, and you're going to be really careful around chemicals so that you don't inhale noxious chemicals that are going to injure your lungs. Um, so I think that's why it doesn't recur very often is because the immune system just doesn't have access to the target. Um, that just sort of makes sense to me. Now, why it occurs in those two different groups, that I got no explanation. Why it would be 15 to 35 and 60 and above, I don't, I don't know. I got no idea. Um, now, ankh associated vasculitis, but you know, yes, it's more likely to relapse, but it's also kind of funny because you'll have people that will go a long, 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 long time with no recurrence. I have, I can think of one patient at least who had kidney limited who has yet to recur. She was diagnosed. She was one of the first patients I saw when I came up here almost eight years ago. She has never had a relapse, never. And she may one day, I don't know. People can go 10, 15 years and still not have a relapse or until they have relapse. I have patients who, you know, every year it's like, are we going to do this again? Must we do this again? <laughs> do we have to do this again? Um, and, and we do know a little bit about why that happens. We know that it depends on exactly which type of ANCA associated vasculitis they have. There's definitely some differences there. But I think one of the reasons that that tends to recur, any form of ANCA vasculitis tends to recur, is that the target is actually a molecule in your a certain type of white blood cell called neutrophils. There are two targets, and both of them occur in these neutrophils. Well, where are your white blood cells? They're in your bloodstream. They're always there. They never go away. So they're just circulating all the time. And then whatever triggers them, um, primes them, activates those neutrophils and exposes the target, that's when you're going to have disease develop. You're much more likely to see that in something that is circulating and just kind of has easier exposure I think, to the immune system. And the neutrophils are part of the immune system, but something kind of goes awry sometimes and they just sort of wholesale start dumping all this stuff, all these horrible chemicals all over the place and um, causing the vascular injury. But the target is not in the blood vessels. Um, with anti-GBM, the target is in the blood vessels. And vasculitis, ankyvasculitis, it's not in the blood vessels. It's in these white blood cells. Yeah. And the chemicals from the white blood cells is then what Think of pouring lye in your blood vessels, right? That would not be good. That's kind of what you're doing. And so I think it's just that the, the availability of the target is, is greater with the ANCA vasculitis than with anti-GBM. That's my made up answer. I love that answer. It sounds Thank very you. possible to me. Um, <laughs> I am going to skip down to our last question and combine it with what one of our um, webinar um, participants has asked because I think they're sort of similar. When a, okay. when a doctor diagnoses you with anti-GBM, is there a way for him or her to know when it first began with that patient? I mean, is there a way to know how much time has passed since the onset of symptoms? And our participant has asked, I have GPA and anti-GBM. Did the GPA precipitate anti-GBM or do you know? <laughs> These are such good questions. Yes. Um, okay, let's do the first question first. So is there a way to know how long you've had it um, with anti-GBM? The answer is no. Um, I, can, I can tell you exactly one patient that I knew how long she had it because she started it in the hospital. So there you go. Um, but what I would say is the impression of anti-GBM is that it is very rapid. So it is highly unlikely that you had anti-GBM for even weeks. Um, I mean, at most days, uh, but probably not weeks, definitely not months or years before it got so obvious, you got so sick that you ended up getting medical care. Um, so there's not really a way to specify other than that. Sometimes when you do the kidney biopsy, 
Um, if you see a lot of scarring, like there's just almost all scarring and no active stuff, that typically means something's been going on longer. But I will tell you that scarring can happen pretty fast when you've just got just this rampant inflammation going through the kidneys. So I would argue that that could still only be days. Um, now, as far as the overlap, ooh, now that was that was a question I was not expecting. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, to me, it would be no more likely that the ANCA precipitated the anti-GBM than that the anti-GBM precipitated the ANCA. Um, I don't think we know why they co-occur. The targets, what we call the antigen, the thing that the immune system is recognizing is so completely different in the two diseases, but they do often occur together. Um, and I've had, that was my trans guy that got transplanted. He would had both. Um, I would say if anything, that yeah, probably the ANCA came first. That, now this is totally conjecture on my part. Let me start there. Because ANCA tends to be oftentimes a systemic disease, meaning it's not just going to affect your lungs and your kidneys. It can affect your eyeballs, your skin, your nervous system, your pick an organ and ears. Yes, all the things. It can affect all the things, not all the things, but most of the things. And so, but it is also a disease that can literally be brewing for years. I have seen a patient who had, I saw her, I met her when she was 48. And she had had symptoms since she was 16 years old, very limited to her sinuses, her whole uh, septum of her nose, that little piece in the middle, had a hole right through it where it had just eat the inflammation had eaten through there since she was 16 years old and didn't have a diagnosis. And so that is a disease that ANCA vasculitis is a disease that can be very slow like that, brewing, 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 or it can be very rapid, very, very rapid, a lot like anti-GBM. So if one sort of in a sense causes or precipitates the other, I would think it would be the ANCA would cause the anti-GBM, but I'm not sure that there's even that connection, but just that there's something completely dysregulated about the immune system. Well, no, okay, now Lil, here's a thing though that just occurs to me as I'm making up answers is because ANCA can also affect the lungs, I would, and the, obviously the kidneys, I could totally envision how you get ANCA first, it causes that lung injury, that kidney injury, that then exposes the basement membrane, that mm -hmm. then your immune system says, well, oh, while I'm causing trouble, why don't I just create that problem too? So then I could see, I got no proof of that. I don't know that there would ever be proof of that. Um, again, you've just got the one in a million disease I think that's going to be, that's one in a million of anti-GBM. Then that's even fewer when you have the overlap. So 25 to 60% of the one in a million. So um, I don't know that there would be a way to prove that, but that that I could make sense of. Well, I, I think that also was a great answer. And I'm saying nodding heads, so they appreciate the <laughs> answer. We got another question just as I was thinking we were going to finish up, but I'm going to ask this one because it seems important to this person. It, they said, I was misdiagnosed for months. I started spitting filament, filaments of blood in October towards my hospitalization, which was in February. I was spitting large sums of blood. I ended up being on a ventilator in the ICU for close to a month. My kidneys stopped functioning during my time in ICU, but kicked back in. Do you believe it was good pasture syndrome the entire time? What we don't know is, has this person specifically been diagnosed with good pasture or if they're asking you to speculate? So, Right, right. So, um, yeah, so I guess there are a lot of unknowns there. And if I understood the timing correctly, there was a little bit of speckledy blood in the sputum starting in October doesn't get really sick until February. That's that seems like a long time to me to be anti-GBM. Can I tell you that's not happening? No, I cannot tell you that. I don't know. Um, that would be somebody that I would hope would have also been tested for ANCA because that would be sort of a not surprising pattern for somebody with ANCA-associated vasculitis. Um, my patient who got a transplant, I told you there's a story for everything. I, I just remember him so clearly. I followed him from the day he came into the hospital until the day he got his transplant, several years later. And when he came into the hospital, he only had kidney involvement, or so it seemed. 
six or so days into his admission, he just all of a sudden, there it comes. There's the blood. He gets rushed to the ICU. They're trying to put a tube in and the blood is just, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be gross. I'm a doctor. It doesn't bother me anymore. So, but, you know, it's just into the two. It was just like it was not clear he was going to survive. He was suddenly bleeding so much. It was like, what in the world is happening? He was not that sick five minutes ago. Um, and so he was on a ventilator. He came off the ventilator, came off dialysis, got a transplant, blah, 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 blah. Um, but somebody who had something that it was conceivably a symptom as early as October and then doesn't have just flagrant disease until February, it does not strike me as anti-GBM-ish. And I wonder if they have overlap or if they were checked for both. And like you said, do we have a confirmed anti-GBM? Is somebody basing that on the blood test? Having just an anti-GBM test in the blood, does that signify disease? Not necessarily. Um, so I'd kind of want to know about some biopsy and some other blood work and stuff. So hard, hard to say. It's a little suspicious, but it seems to me less likely that it would just be anti-GBM. Yes. You know, un unfortunately, we have gotten a few more comments in here, and I, I just need to tell the participants some of the questions are general kidney type um, questions related to other vasculitis diseases. And since we're mainly covering anti-GBM at this time, I think, um, and we're almost, we're a little over <laughs> our time. I think, um, I hope everybody will be comfortable with the answers that they've gotten today as relating to the topic of anti-GBM. I think I just learned so much about this super rare disease on rare disease day. I just uh, think it was a wonderful um, webinar presentation. And also your questions have been great, Dr. Brand. Is there anything else that you feel like you would like to add? I would say the only couple of things are if you really have a birding question, um, I think there's probably a way through the VF to, I know Ed, who kind of coordinates all this stuff, will sometimes get emails from people that he'll send to me. Um, so if you really have a burning question that you want an answer to, um, reach out to the VF and usually somebody will get a, a message to me. And if it's something I can answer or if it's appropriate for me to answer, I'm happy to do that. Um, again, I can't tell you about treatment and I'm not going to critique your provider. Sorry, can't do that. Right. Um, and speaking of providers, the only other uh, recommendation I would be is make sure that you um, have a provider who understands what they're treating. Um, and I will tell you a lot of, and this is not a, um, a, a criticism, a lot of providers are not comfortable treating these diseases. I'm comfortable treating these diseases because I trained where we saw a lot of it and I did two extra years of fellowship just so I could become a little bit more comfortable. Um, but I, you, I'm not the person you want to see if you've got a problem with your potassium or your sodium. So, <laughs> and yeah. I should be, but I'm not. So, so you just, and if I, there's somebody like that, I literally, I send them to one of my colleagues and go, yeah, you don't want me for that. I'm not good at that. Um, so, and if you have somebody who um, says they're not comfortable I will tell you, it is not uncommon for patients to go see someone who is familiar with treating that disease just to get recommendations and still be managed by their primary provider. Kathy can tell you, we see that all the time when I was at UNC. We have patients come from all over the country, all over the world. They would come, they would get information from us, and though we would relay those recommendations to their provider saying, Here's what we think that you should be doing with this. I have patients, they're not coming from all over the world. They just spend half their year in Florida or Arizona because it's cold up here. <laughs> and, um, and in fact, I got, I had one of those calls today, a, a patient who, when he's in Florida, has a nephrologist he sees. And he called me and he said, oh, hey, we need to do this and this. Is that okay? And this is the right time. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. So, um, so it, 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 your provider, if they're not comfortable, should be comfortable with you doing that. Right. You should not have a provider who says, no, I don't want you doing that. You get what you need, period. I tell my own patients, if you're not comfortable with what I'm telling you, I'm more than happy to refer you to somebody else. Or if you want to go to somebody else, you're not going to hurt my feelings. You get what you need. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Elizabeth Brandt, for your um, great answers to everything. We did get um, information. It is in the chat box for those of you that have access to it. You can reach out 
to two different people at the Vasculitis Foundation. The emails are in there. One is Emily and it's E-G-I-R-D-W-O-O-D at vasculitisfoundation.org. Or you can reach out to Ed Becker and that's E Becker at vasculitisfoundation.org. So either one of those can get the appropriate questions to Dr. Brandt or can help you find somebody that can answer your questions. But Dr. Brandt, thank you so much. It was great to see you again. It was great to well. have a webinar on this um, important day for rare diseases. And um, I hope everyone will just follow up with keeping track with the Vasculitis Foundation so you can see when we have our very next educational webinar in this series. And thank you so and much. And yes. we have our big meeting coming up in July. So look on the website for that. It's a wonderful in-person meeting. You will it might be the only chance you have to meet other patients who have your disease and talk to them and, and share their share the experience and kind of see what it's like for people. It's a it's just an amazing, wonderful meeting and it is all about patients. So it's an it is about as non-scary of a meeting as there can be. It's a lot of fun. It's it really is, a lot of that, fun. That I have to echo that. And it's in Chicago in July. It's like the second week in July. Yeah, I think the 14th to the 16th, but don't yes. quote me. It's on a weekend, and yep. um, it is how I met one of my best friends uh, 14 years ago at a nice. foundation symposium, and we both have the same disease. So awesome. we've, we've supported each other for 14 years. So anyway, thank you so much, Dr. Brent, and thank you to everybody for participating, and we'll see you in the next webinar. Thanks, everybody. Bye.